which are known to mitigate the high associated with THC, making the patient feel more relaxed instead of anxious. There are 400 other compounds in the plant, including 70 other sort of lookalikes to Delta 9 THC, and those are all there for a reason. They provide balance, if you will, the yin and the yang, and, you know, my opinion that you lose that balance when you remove the single most psychoactive component from the plant and, and use that as a pharmaceutical. I've used Marinol uh, on some patients selectively. Uh, I've not had any problem with Marinol. Dr. Voth says while he's not overly impressed with Marinol, he would rather have patients take a pill. He says telling a patient to smoke an illegal plant is substandard medicine. I treat a lot of sick patients with all sorts of different pain and neuropathic disorders and cancer, etc. And I cannot think of one circumstance in 27 years of active practice that I've had to say, well, it's time for you to smoke dope. I just haven't. And that includes terminal patients and hospice patients. Anyone who says that, you know, we have adequate treatments for all of the conditions for which marijuana is purported to have uh, some effect, I don't think that is a correct statement. I, I think the fact is that we have a lot of difficult to treat conditions and there may be a niche or a place for the cannabinoids uh, with some of those conditions. Oncology social worker Wendy Gwenner agrees. She's personally seen patients who don't get adequate relief from the anti-nausea drugs. And when it comes to getting patients to eat... It is far and away the best medication that we have for chronic wasting and for increasing appetite in cancer patients. There's probably nothing that works as well for appetite stimulation that we have as, as marijuana. But Dr. Hensold says cannabis does have one side effect that certain patients don't like, namely the high. Most of the side effects I worry about with patients are really the, the euphoria and the altered sense of consciousness that people get um, and whether they'll tolerate that or not. Generally you'd consider a high as an adverse effect, so <clears throat> that adverse side effect for people who don't want to be high is really a problem. For other patients, though, the high could be part of the therapeutic effect. A 1999 U.S. Institute of Medicine report on marijuana found the drug's anti-anxiety and sedative effects could be a benefit. I can't convince myself that the psychoactive part doesn't play a part. If they feel good, that's terrific. But does feeling good lead to addiction? Absolutely. Marijuana is habituating, addictive, whatever you want to call it. Dr. Voth says marijuana has about the same addictive potential as alcohol. The 99 government report found marijuana was slightly less addictive than alcohol, with 9% of all users experiencing addiction. And marijuana does not have the extreme physical withdrawal symptoms that alcohol and other drugs do. Potential for withdrawal is, is really minimal because uh, the cannabinoids are stored in fat so that if you stop using marijuana abruptly it still leaches out from fat over a number of days so you don't get a precipitous withdrawal. Regardless of the mild withdrawal symptoms, Dr. Voth believes marijuana's side effects and its addictive potential are just a few of the factors that make it unattractive for drug companies to research. I think it's very unlikely that marijuana <clears throat> will ever make it through the FDA. It's the fact that you're smoking dope that you're smoking a plant. You're smoking something with 488 substances in it. So there's the rub. Schedule 1 is a side issue. It may chill things a little, but it's really that you're looking at smoking dope as a medication. Dr. Voth is not the only one concerned about smoking. The 99 Institute of Medicine report says smoked marijuana is a crude THC delivery system that also delivers harmful substances. There's a lot of things that have hit the, the literature that have talked about head and neck tumors, for instance, um, oral tumors, lung cancers even. The Institute of Medicine found that marijuana smoke can deposit up to four times the amount of tar in the lungs of a cannabis smoker as a tobacco smoker. Studies have also shown that marijuana smoke contains higher concentrations of the same carcinogens found in cigarette smoke. While scientists are concerned these factors may lead to lung cancer, they still have not found definitive proof. And patient Point Hatfield says smoking is worth the risk. The thing about smoking the marijuana is it's immediate. 
you don't wait 20 minutes or half an hour or whatever it's immediate and for me immediate relief was a blessing when you smoke cannabis by the way the peak concentration in the bloodstream occurs in two and a half minutes when it goes through your lungs it goes into the right side of the heart into the left side of the heart and then right up to the br to the brain most people prefer the inhalation method because they can better titrate when the effect comes on how long it lasts Dr. Grant says until someone comes up with a fast-acting inhaler, smoking may be their best option. I'm not sort of in the camp of people who say, well, I grant you marijuana may work, but it's absolutely unacceptable because it's smoked. Uh, I don't think that's right. Do you worry about patients smoking? I, I don't. I look at the cost benefit. The cost of having untreated cancer would be far outweigh whatever carcinogens might be introduced to the lungs. Even Irvin Rosenfeld, a patient who smokes 10 to 20 marijuana cigarettes a day, doesn't waste any time worrying about the smoke. No. Why not? First of all, I have over 200 tumors in my body that could go malignant. I should live so long as to die of lung cancer. Okay. A 2006 lung cancer study funded by the National Institute on Drug Abuse gives Rosenfeld even more to smile about. Researchers unexpectedly found that chronic, heavy marijuana smokers not only had no increased risk of developing lung cancer, but they actually had a decreased risk. Marijuana contains anti-inflammatory, uh, antioxidant, and probably anti-cancer compounds in it. This is where the complexity of the plant is both a blessing and a curse. With dozens of cannabinoids and hundreds of other compounds, it's difficult to pinpoint the source of the beneficial effects found in the smoking study. There are challenges in doing research on something that has, you know, 150 different chemicals in it. Critic Dr. Eric Voth believes the true medical potential of cannabis lies in targeting some of those chemicals, not smoking the entire plant. There are elements in the cannabinoids and various cannabinoids that have a lot of positive effect and very little addictive or uh, high causing effects. Scientists have managed to isolate and focus attention on one of those. It's called cannabidiol and next to THC it's one of the most abundant cannabinoids in the plant. CBD is cannabidiol which is another cannabinoid uh, like the main psychoactive ingredient but instead of getting people high CBD seems to be a very potent anti-inflammatory and analgesic so it relieves pain and decreases inflammation and anti-inflammatory and analgesic so it relieves pain and decreases inflammation but what I'll do is I'll just kind of put the stove on low I'll spoon out a little bit of the can of butter about about that much as a dose is worth for the night and um, I'll put it into the pan and just let it melt down CBDs seem to help my seizures. I'm not using it to, to get any psychological effects off of it. I'm just eating the butter raw with bread, so warmed up. And how often do you take, do you take that? Once a day, twice a day? At night, right before bed. I used to be on approximately 14 different prescriptions, and uh, I would still have up to 12 seizures a day. I used to, have to take two handfuls of pills, no more. While this 27-year-old epilepsy patient is relieved to be taking medical marijuana, she's considerably more anxious about showing her face and has requested we conceal her identity. Why do you not want to show your face? I am not comfortable showing my face because of all the discrimination that has already happened. She says both she and her husband have lost jobs when she spoke openly about her use of marijuana as a medicine. But the fact of the matter is somebody has to speak up or nobody will hear these stories. She chose to tell us her story in her artist's studio. Here she creates much happier works than she did even a few years ago when her self-portraits plainly showed the toll epilepsy had taken since she was diagnosed at 15. I've taken pretty much every anti-epileptic on the market and some with a little bit more success than others. Some of the medicines I, w I was on had nothing to do with epilepsy, and the doctors put me on them to help me sleep or to help with my anxiety issues. The seizures were so bad I needed to be sedated heavily to sleep. The depression gets worse the more you're sedated. 
Despite the constant seizures and depression, she graduated high school and was accepted into a private women's college to study psychology and fine arts. The seizures were so intense by my early 20s that I, I couldn't stay in class. And as the stress of exams would come closer, that would trigger seizures. She had to withdraw from college just a handful of credits short of graduation. The seizures were so bad and the medication so debilitating that getting a job wasn't even an option. She was bed bound for years while the epilepsy ruled her life. My husband would have to call me, you know, 25 times a day from work just to make sure I was still breathing okay. Um, I could not shower by myself because if I slipped and fell, you know, it only takes a half inch to drown. So we were living on pins and needles with me having that many. That's when she decided to move to a state with a medical marijuana program. She had read stories about its potential to treat epilepsy and she wanted legal access to it. How did that impact your seizures? They started slowing down. I had to build it up in my system and it, it wasn't until I started ingesting it that they really stopped completely. The potential of the CBDs in marijuana to mitigate epileptic seizures is not new. Scientists who put together the 1982 U.S. Institute of Medicine report found substantial evidence from animal studies to indicate that cannabinoids are effective in blocking seizures and that there is strong support for further investigation into the utility of CBD in human epilepsy. The subsequent 1999 Institute of Medicine report was less enthusiastic, saying the solid scientific evidence still isn't there yet, and it was unlikely to be a fruitful area for drug research. Well, I'm not waiting for the FDA approval to come through. It is, I know how it affects my body, and that's one thing that I've learned through taking prescription drugs all these years. I have to know how this stuff is going to affect me, not what somebody else says it does for them. Not only has it completely stopped her seizures, but she says something in the plant works for her anxiety, depression, and insomnia, too. So she sees the scientifically undesirable cornucopia of substances in the plant as a benefit, not a detriment. The fact is it works. It works better than anything I've ever tried, any pill I've ever taken. The cannabinoids have multiple actions. It's not just for on pain or, in her case, maybe anti-epileptic action, but... For, for many people, they have a sedative and any anxiety effect and so forth. I'm a cancer doctor and I often suggest to my patients that they consider marijuana for their loss of appetite, nausea, pain, depression, and insomnia. It's one medicine they could use instead of five. Critics of medical marijuana are highly skeptical of claims it can treat just about everything. How is it possible that one plant has the potential to treat so many different ailments? Intriguing answers started appearing in the early 90s when researchers pinpointed receptors in the brain and the body that bind with the cannabinoids. Receptors can be described as locks on the surface of a cell, and when the correct key binds with the correct lock or receptor, it opens the door and delivers messages. Sometimes the message is that the body is feeling pain. Other times the message may be that there's an invader and the immune system must attack. Scientists located two receptors, uh, cannabinoid receptors, one called the CB1 receptor, mainly in the brain, and the other is the CB2 receptor, which is mainly in cells of the immune system. The CB1 receptors are extremely abundant in the brain, but they're also found all over the body in the major organs, the heart, the liver, kidneys, and pancreas. After finding all these locks that accepted the cannabis key, researchers made the next big discovery. The human body makes its own cannabinoids, called endocannabinoids. We have this whole elaborate system where we have these receptors in our brain and in our immune system and these circulating chemicals that we produce ourselves that really are very, very similar to the chemicals in the marijuana plant. The only difference is that the endocannabinoids that we produce are in such small quantities and they're also rapidly degraded so that therefore we are not high all the time or you know we don't have that feeling of euphoria all the time. Dr. Prakash Nayagarkati is a professor of pathology and microbiology at the University of South Carolina. For the last decade he's been doing research on what's become known as the human endocannabinoid system. The precise functions of the endocannabinoid system 
is uh, it's still being uh, understood.